coming up on Fresh View with Pastor Inkechi Ene. When you are abreast of this truth, when this truth is at your fingertips, when that knowledge is so ingrained in your inner man, you will not be like Jacob who said, the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. You'll be able to put your hand on your chest and say, God is in this place. You'll be able to acknowledge regularly and constantly to yourself that God has come to stay. The evolution of television is here. Start your week with Fresh Deal with Pastor Nkechi Ene, now airing once a week, every Monday at 9.30 p.m. West African time on Fake TV. Keep the flow of fresh inspiration and direction for your life every day, Monday to Friday, on life-changing episodes online on YouTube, Facebook, Mixler, Spotify, and Twitter. Stay updated on www.freshdew.tv for more details. Fresh Dew, bringing fresh inspiration and direction for your life. Hello there, hello, welcome to Fresh Dew today. Fresh Dew is a program designed to give fresh inspiration and direction for your life. Today on Fresh Dew, I have the privilege to bring the word of God to you. Uh, the host of the program, Pastor Nke Chiene, has asked me to do that. I'm Pastor Shola Akinwale, and I serve as the Associate Pastor of the Carpenters Church under Pastor Nke Chiene, and I'm grateful to her for giving me her platform to share the Word of God with you. And so this week, we have been looking at this message, God Has Come to Stay. Today is part four. And this is in a mini book, it's in a hard book format. It's also a mini book uh, format. I taught this message in church a while back and it came out eventually as a book. And that's what I'm sharing with us on the program uh, this week. So, like I said, this is part four. Let's read our text again. First John chapter four, verse 12 to 16. It says, no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. We, the key word in our study is the word abide and abides, which of course in our text five times. And that word is the Greek word meno, which means to stay in a given place, state, relation, or expectancy. It's translated as abide, dwell, continue, remain, stand, and tarry. So by listening, hearing the meanings of that word abide, it gives us the impression of something that is stable, something that remains, or in our, for the purpose of our teaching, a person who stays. So if he says in verse 15 there that whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him. We could say God stays in him. God remains in him. The moment God walks in, he comes in, he, he comes in there and he's there to stay. So we've covered two main points. Firstly, we've said that when God comes, he stays. Secondly, salvation made it possible for God to come to stay in you as a child of God. And now number three today, by his spirit, God stays in you. Or we could say by his spirit, God lives in you. Now look at verse 13 of our text. We see another abide word there. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. So two things we see here immediately are abiding in him and he abiding in us. And again, this is one of John's unique and favorite phrases. He, and he, I believe he picked up on this from when Jesus was teaching uh, in that great 
t conversation Jesus had in John 13 to John chapter 17, John chapter 14, I believe it was 20, Jesus said, and in that day, you will know that I am in you, you in me, and the Father in me, and so forth. So John probably must definitely uh, must have picked it up from there. So God is living in us. There is another truth, a corollary truth, which is that we also abide uh, in him, all right? But the main thrust of uh, our teaching here is our focus on him abiding in us. And he tells us in that verse that the way we know that he abides in us is by his spirit. So the Holy Spirit is God in us. The Holy Spirit is Christ in us, and the Holy Spirit is, is in us. God is manifested in three persons, and interestingly in our text, we see the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. We know God the Father, you know, is what he refers to when he says God dwells in him. But we also know that Christ dwells in us as children of God, because Paul said in Colossians 1.27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of the, this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. But how does Christ dwell in you as a believer? It, we know that Christ is God. We know having been raised up, he's seated at the right hand of God. He left this earth, the Bible tells us in, in Mark chapter 16, and he went to heaven. He was seated at the right hand of God. So how is he in us? Well, he's in us through the person of the Spirit because the Holy Spirit is God on the inside of us. The Holy Spirit is Christ in us. So Jesus Christ can be in us. God the Father can be in us and he is, Jesus is, through the person of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ and he's also called the Spirit of God. Let me show that to you in Romans chapter 8, verse 9 to 10. It says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you now. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. So there you have it in verse 9. It says, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. So if you're a child of God, indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. And then he goes on to say, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ. So the Spirit of God is the Spirit of Christ who has come to live in you. So let's look at some things about this point we have, which is by, by his Spirit, God stays in you. Look at our text there. Look at verse 13. It says, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. The first thing I want to draw your attention to is that we have the first fruits of the spirit. We have the first fruits of the spirit. Now, that word of in that verse is the Greek word ek, ek, which means from, and it denotes a source. So the verse could very well say, he has given us from his spirit. So if he tells us he has given us from the spirit, it seems to say, and I believe it's safe to suggest, that, that there are different aspects, different facets, different distributions, if you want, if you will, different uh, uh, portions, for lack of a better term, that can come from the Holy Spirit. So we have one spirit, but he has different works and different manifestations in our lives. There is one spirit. It says he has given us of, out of his spirit, all right? And this text we have is actually speaking about salvation, the new birth. So when we accept Jesus Christ, we have what we can call the first fruits of the spirit, this is what Paul discusses in Romans 8 and verse 23. Notice what it says. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Paul speaks about the first fruits of the Spirit. And this is what is the new birth, salvation that we've discussed. Why call what we receive the first fruits? Why did, does he use first fruits? You can only use first fruits, right, if there is more to the, to, 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 to the work of the Spirit. In fact, Paul said somewhere else, I believe he said that in Rome, uh, sorry, that would be in Ephesians chapter 1, where he talked about the Holy Spirit is the earnest, he's the deposit of, the, of our inheritance 
And that word means the, the down payment. Uh, Arbon, I believe, is the Greek word. It refers to the down payment, the first payment made. And when you make a first payment, that means there are other things that are to come. So when we get saved, we receive that. We receive that measure in salv salvation. And it shows that there are other, the other measurements, other portions, other uh, manifestations, and other works of the Spirit of God after the new birth. But the first fruit is what every child of God receives. And this is really what guarantees salvation. Because after the first fruit measure, in other words, after you're born again, there's also another gift available to you as a child of God, which comes on the heels of that, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's also called the gift of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit coming upon you. Now, a lot of Christians, you know, squabble and quibble and argue over this. Some will tell you, well, when I got born again, I received all of the Holy Spirit there is. And for you to do that, you either have to extrapolate into several scriptures or deny the presence of script, several scriptures. You know, you either turn a blind eye and say those verses don't exist in the Bible or, or, or they mean something else. And that's what happens when you extrapolate. You bring something different from the context. The scripture is clear and the book of Acts has several examples. And Pastor actually has her book uh, coming out, uh, Dancing with, 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 with Your Spirit, Being Led by God's Spirit. And she discusses these things there, you know, which was, this was actually taught on Makaira Moment, which was aired a while back uh, recently on Fresh Dew. And there are different measurements of the Holy Spirit. But when you get born again, that is one. Then you get filled with the Holy Spirit or baptized with the Holy Spirit or the, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes upon you. These are different phrases referring to the same thing. And the book of Acts is filled with so many examples of that. But even after you're filled with the Holy Spirit, which is for empowering, for living, and for service, there is also something available to every child of God, which Ephesians 5.18 captures, which is where he says, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Or we know it more literally to mean be being filled with the Spirit, constantly filled with the Holy Spirit. That is the way to draw upon the rivers of living water that came into you when you were filled with the Holy Spirit, as well as plumbed into the depth of that well of salvation that you received when you accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. You keep it fresh. You keep it going. So all of these are showing that there are different uh, measurements, if you like, of the Spirit available to a child of God. But the one by which we know that you are a child of God is that one John describes. He has given us of, from his Spirit. And that's the first fruit of the Spirit whereby every child of God knows that they are saved. The Spirit of God bearing witness in their spirit. And it is that what comf and, and, and it's that presence that, that uh, every believer literally has. Even, when, even after you're filled with the Spirit, there's also what is that Paul talked in Galatians chapter 3, he who ministers to you the Spirit, you know, and works miracles are, uh, among you. He who ministers. So there's a constant ministration of the Spirit, life in the Spirit, available to every child of God. But again, the one that is static and is constant for every child of God that you know, you see, you're not saved because you are baptized with the Holy Spirit. And this is one of the reasons people argue. They say things like, oh, but I'm saved now. I'm saved. I've received. I'm born again. So are you saying if I'm not baptized with the Holy Spirit, I'll not make heaven. I'm not saved. Nobody is saying that. We've already seen that. But if you want to enjoy heaven on earth, and you want to enjoy in fullness what the Holy Spirit came to do in your life, then you go beyond that and you can be filled with the Spirit of God and maintain a Spirit-filled life, all right? Something else we need to see from this is the fact that we need to develop a God-inside-mindedness. God-inside-mindedness. God wants you to develop a God-inside-mindedness or a consciousness within you. Look at the verse we read again. Let me draw something out there. It says, By this we know that we abide in him, and he in us. For what reason? Because he has given us of his spirit. So the way we know that he's in us is by the spirit. So God is not just content on dwelling in us. What else do we see from there? He wants us to know 
that he's in us. And that comes with a con that consciousness brings peace. It brings security. It brings confidence. It brings calmness to you in the circumstances and in the situations of life. When you are abreast of this truth, when this truth is at your fingertips, when that knowledge is so ingrained in your inner man, you will not be like Jacob who said, the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. You'll be able to put your hand on your chest and say, God is in this place. You'll be able to acknowledge regularly and constantly to yourself that God has come to stay. Look at Genesis 12, uh, 28, pardon me, 8, 28, 16 and 17. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. The word know there, where Jacob said, I did not know, the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it, is the Hebrew word yada, which means to know, uh, to ascertain by seeing. It's used in various senses, figuratively, literally, and so forth. It's translated uh, observation, care, recognition, it also means to perceive, to see, to find out, and to discern. That tells you that the presence of the Lord is discerned. You don't know the Lord is in a place by your feelings. You know it by revelation. You know it by discernment. And the more you train yourself in the things of the Spirit of God, you become more conscious of the presence of God. You become more conscious of his indwelling. But Jacob's exclamation in verse 16 shows us that God can be in a place right? And a person may not know that he's there. So in the case of Jacob, how did he know that God was there? God gave him a vision. God gave him a dream. God revealed that to him. You don't necessarily need a dream because you have the word of God that tells you. And you should take the word of God as what it says. God says, whoever confesses Jesus as saved, as, as, is, the, as the son of God, God dwells in him. So you just say, Father, your word says so, and I believe it. And then you act as though God is true irrespective of how you feel. Your feelings have absolutely nothing to do about it. And you see, if God is in you and you don't know, what do you think is going to happen? Well, what's going to happen is that you're going to act as though he's not there. You're going to be looking for what you have somewhere else. And that place, notice Jacob also called that, Jacob called that place the house of God, Bethel, which means God's house. God's dwelling. He says, God is in this place. I did not know it. And he later on, in addition, calls that place also the gate of heaven. A gate is a portal. A gate is an opening. He said, this place is none other than the house of God. This house of God, get this, is the gate of heaven. Friend, what, what is the house of God today? The house of God today is your body. The house of God to, today is you, the believer. We've seen that. You are God's permanent residence. You are his temple. You are his home. You are his dwelling place. You are his point of contact, one of his points of contact on the earth because he's come to live in you. And you now, your spirit as a child of God, is that portal, can have access to everything divine. Jacob called a physical place the house of God. The house of God today now is not a building. It's not a physical locale. The house of God is you. Your body, your spirit, indwelt by the Spirit of God, opens you up to a world of heavenly realities and heavenly possibilities. Glory to God. And through the Spirit of God in your spirit, you can make contact with God. You can make contact with everything Calvary provided and everything that God has richly abounded towards you in grace. So all you need to do really is to develop intimacy and romance with the Spirit of God because he's there, and he's there, and he's there to make you know that he's there. If you don't know he's there, again, I, re I repeat it, you will, you will live as though he's not there, and you may end up looking for what you already have. So this brings me to the last thought. The place of knowledge is kind of like connected to what I just said. The place of knowledge is important. Knowledge is vital. Again, verse 13 says, by this we know. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us. The word know is a favorite of John. And I don't know whether there's any other writer that uses that word know, 
more than John. In just five chapters, he uses it so, several times. We, he says in 1 John 5, 13, we know that we have eternal life. He says in 1 John 5, uh, 14, I believe, and 15, if we know he hears us, we know we have eternal life. We know that we are of God. He, he keeps on using that word. We find another no here. By this we know that we abide in him. And that word no here, he uses the word ginosko and edo, but here it's ginosko, which means to learn, to know, to come to know, to get a knowledge of, all right? Ginosko often suggests an inception or progress of knowledge. So if you don't know God dwells in you today, no problem, you're knowing now. I know God dwells in me. It's one of my confessions. I've already said it severally today. I say it all the while. Thank you, Father. I pray from that consciousness. I live in that consciousness. I've learned to look on the inside many times when I need answers to things. Just ask him who dwells on the inside of me. But the working knowledge I'm at, I am in right now is not where I was five years or ten years ago. So that knowledge increases and that knowledge grows. And the more that knowledge grows, the more your appreciation of divine things will increase and your experience in the life of God and the things that God has made available to you will also it will also increase. So the word no is important because if you don't know God is dwelling there, like I said, you live as though he's not there. You know, there's a proverb we have over here in Nigeria. It says, what you're looking for in Sokoto is in your Shokoto. <laughs> you know, Sokoto, if you know Nigeria's map, is one of the far-flung or farther states in the north of, of our nation and borders other, uh, another country, I believe. Shokoto is a Yoruba word which refers to trouser. So the adage simply says, what you're looking for in, in, in Sokoto State, that means at the farthest end, is right on you in your trouser. And have you looked for something sometimes and, you know, probably a key or some small object, which is actually in your po pocket or something that's very close by, you just saw it, then for some reason you can't find it. And then you trace back, where did I go? Where did I go? You even call someone. I was in this place. I'm looking for this thing. And when you find it, you find it in the most, you know, excuse my language, appears the silliest place. I mean, it may actually have been on you. And that's an example of what was in, on your, in your Shokoto. You are looking for in Sokoto State, you know, a far place. And many times Christians are looking for what they already have. They're looking for wisdom. Whereas Christ has been made unto them wisdom. They're looking for peace. Whereas Jesus said, my peace I will give you and no one will take it. They're looking for joy. And joy is in the spirit in God who indwells you. They're looking for, they're looking for love, as we're going to see. But love is already on the inside of them. There is a place for you to begin to know gradually. And when you get to know this, life will become different. If you look at 1 Corinthians 3, 16, 1 Corinthians 6, 15 and 19, Paul uses the word know. And in several places there where it speaks about God dwelling in us, and this is in the New Testament, the place of knowledge is emphasized. I don't have the time to read those verses, but 1 Corinthians 3.16, 1 Corinthians 6.15 and 19 are just examples. And it keeps on emphasizing the place of knowledge because if you do not know who you are, then you cannot maximize who you are, right? And you will not experience the fullness of that provision of God living on the inside of you. My prayer is that the eyes of your understanding will be enlightened so that you can come to be, you can begin to comprehend Christ in you, the Father in you, in the person of the Holy Spirit who has come to live, live and dwell on the inside of you, child of God, to stay. Father, thank you for your word today. And thank you for showing us that you are in us and you are in us in the person of your spirit. We'll be, begin to acknowledge this and begin to act on this truth. We give you praise and glory, Father, in Jesus' name. You have so many questions about your life and life in general. Why? When, how, what, who, and the list goes on. Sister, Jesus is the answer to every question and he loves you just the way you are. He loves you too much to leave you this way. 
He is knocking on the door of your heart. Will you make a decision for a change today? To surrender your life to Jesus Christ, the Son of a living God. If you want to do that, say this prayer out loud, meaning it from the depth of your heart, according to Romans 10, 8 to 13, and you will be saved. Lord Jesus, I come to you today. I believe you are the Son of God and that you died for me and rose again just to save me. Come into my heart and make me brand new as you have promised. I will live for you all the days of my life. In your name I pray, amen. Amen and amen. Congratulations on taking the most important decision of your life. You are now born again and a brand new person. It has all happened on the inside of you. We can help you grow in your new faith so that what has just happened on the inside will surely be reflected in your everyday life. Please call us at 0700 Fresh Dew or email us at saved at freshdew.tv and we will be there for you. Romans 10 17 says, So then, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You can order today's message and other past messages on our website store, freshdew.tv. It is available on MP3 and CD and also on MP4 and DVD just as seen on TV. Fresh Dew, giving you fresh inspiration and direction for your life. Thank you for watching Fresh Dew today with Pastor Nkichi Ene. We trust you were blessed by today's episode. For further information on Fresh Dew, please call us on 0700 Fresh Dew, which is 0700 3737 4339. If you're calling from outside Nigeria, the number will be plus 234 700 3737 4339. Our phones are open from 9 a.m. to 11 p.m. GMT plus one. You can also send us an email to info at freshdew.tv and we'll be glad to serve you. We also invite you to like, follow, and interact with us on our Twitter and Facebook pages at Fresh Dew TV and also on Pastor Nkechi's Facebook pages at Pastor Ketch. For more information on how you can partner with Fresh Dew and receive Pastor Nkechi's monthly letters and weekly MP3 gifts, please visit our website www.freshdew.tv. Once again, thanks for being with us today and we look forward to seeing you next time on Fresh Dew to receive fresh inspiration and direction for your life.